Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to this edition of Conversations with a Pro Trader. I'm your host, Greta Walt. The live chat is open for everyone to submit questions to David during this event. Uh, so please do submit those in the second half here. Uh, I will be asking him those for you. Uh, so submit them, let them pile up, and then we'll have a good section of audience questions uh, over at, at the end. So for David, uh, give, your, give the audience a little bit of an intro of yourself, how you got started trading, how you found T3, how long you've been in this world, et cetera. Just kind of the cliff notes version. Okay. And I'll try and make it a little briefer since we went <laughs> through all this. We, by the way, folks, we've done this already, but it was between me, myself, and Greg. There was a few people okay. live, uh, but yeah. Yeah. So I started in the business in the mid nineties, a few years after leaving college. It was my second career. Uh, as a, a mid 20 year old. And I went into money management, uh, retail, some smaller institutional money management and um, learned from the bottom up. I knew I wanted to get into corporate finance and own paper and help back companies. That led me to uh, two dear friends and uh, we became partners and started a firm called Broadband Capital. I came a little later in the scenario and uh, we started doing a lot of VC definitely a lot more VC than PE and um, learned money management. Um, along the way, I um, encountered 2000 and the crash. And during that period of time, I thought, you know what? I'm not a great money manager yet. I don't know what the hell comes next. I don't want to lose anyone money. This is scary. I'll trade my own money. I don't need commissions and I certainly don't want to hurt anyone. So I'll trade my own money. Lo and behold, I made a lot of money. And I just kept doing it and kept taking small numbers and turning them to large numbers. And my partners and I, who own this firm, they said, you know, the market's crashed. The commission business is down huge. We have to stay in business. Like you're making all this money. Can you trade the firm money? I said, yeah, I'll try it. And that worked out. And one day they looked at me and they said, we know you were a drama major in college. We know you were in the nightclub business, but you maybe should be a hedge fund manager. I'm like, really? I think. Um, and I thought, well, I'm not really cut out for this, but yeah, it seems to be working. Maybe I should try it. And that was, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. It's a long time now. Uh, did that, continued with private equity and uh, VC. We focused on jockeys and backing uh, really successful people who had great ideas that we thought we could believe in and help uh, maybe make two and two 10 and be uh, good partners. And we are more a merchant bank. We put our own money in. We were first money in Vroom. We did Montrose. We did some Chinese companies like Elon, that's uh, one of the largest uh, Expedia type companies, travel companies in China. Mm -hmm. um, we did uh, two cannabis companies that have gone public in the US markets. Hydro Farm went public through uh, JP Morgan. And they've all been pretty successful exits with a lot of liquidity for people at uh, many multiples. You know, Hydro Farm's a great example to did the deal at 250 million second round maybe 500 million eventually goes public it was fully liquid at well into the billions two three billion dollar market cap i think the stock went to like 90 or something it's crushed now on like a dollar but um we've, we've done some good deals and had about four exits during that time um long story short i got bored running my fund during the day over trading needed some companionship something to do during the day and not find myself trading millions of shares of Qs and over trading. <laughs> so several years ago, I found T3 and Scott Redler. He is an awesome guy, got along well, um, kind of do a little bit of the same thing. And I found myself answering a lot of questions and having 8,000 emails and Facebooks and blah, blah, blah. And after six, seven years on there, I said, wow, this is exhausting. It's like a third job I have since I already have the fund and uh, venture capital. Why don't I just do this all in one chat so I don't have to answer 5,000 different questions and maybe I'll get some more institution type people on so I can get some idea flow from them and let's start the inner circle and that's how we got to where we are today. All right. So just for everyone uh, who is here, uh, you may be from the inner circle, you may not be, but David is a the leader of the inner circle virtual trading floor with T3 live. Um, so that's what he's talking about when he talks about his community of traders. So David, my first question for every trader on these events is how would you grade your week of trading so far on your typical grading scale, A, B, C, D, F, and why? 
We're going to do this quick, folks, because we actually did this <laughs> in a previous chat about 10 minutes ago. And my answer to her was, within those letters, is there a luck? Because it's, <laughs> it's a dumb luck week. It's Shangri-La, I like to call it this week, mm -hmm. where we prepared for an event and it took place. And it usually doesn't happen with such perfection. So it's been an A-plus week. Definitely some luck in there, but a phenomenal week thus far. That's good. All right. So since you say it's been a good week and uh, it has been a quieter week of economic data for the market, so we're not getting as many news driven days happening. Uh, tell me about the best trade you've had so far this week and what made it the best. And just like before, I'm going to shorten this up. My best trade is seven different stocks because what we did early last week or what I did is said, listen, I know this is not conventional wisdom, but we can't go any higher. It can't be led by Meta and Microsoft and Amazon and NVIDIA. This has gotten nuts. I really foresee a lot of risk there. And if there's going to be further upside, it's got to come from mid small caps. It's time to own IWM and what's underneath. And we rearranged our portfolios, bought quite a bit in the mid to small cap space, went fairly large on IWM under 180. And several names worked, especially IWM. And while doing so, I said, I still see downside in the queues. And I said, at least 350 this week, maybe lower. So we were very focused for the last, since Monday, on puts at three, the 347, 348 puts. I can't remember which strike. For Friday, those paid, they paid big. Our longs paid, IWM paid. Big cap tech sold off. It kind of all came together. So that was our best trade of the week, all together in one. <laughs> Portfolio switch. Big, All right. big and, and in these events, you know, we try to be realistic about, you know, the good and the bad of being a full time trader. Uh, so tell me on the flip side of that, what's been your worst trade of the week and what made it the worst for you? Lululemon. I really wanted to buy it as it came into its lows after a great earnings number. I've had a lot of success with that. In fact, I sometimes look for them to break the earnings gap to the downside and find a level that I really like to be a swing investor, not just for the day. I did that with Lulu, caught a few points to the upside, didn't sell enough, I went back down, I went right back into it. As I went lower, I started adding some, so I'm not seeing much strength, gotta leave room, can't be big. Tomorrow, if we don't see some strength, if we don't see the stock firm, and it doesn't hold this 350 to 360 area, it's a bad trade. Sure enough, it didn't, uh, we took a loss, it wasn't tragic because it was one of those trading days where we caught a bounce, 366 to 370s, but then bought it right back and didn't get out till 360 and under. So uh, ultimately, we cut the position, took the loss. And as I told you previously, when it was just me, you, and myself, uh, <laughs> I was a little upset. And then I looked at it today as low as like 352 and realized, oh, taking a loss wasn't so bad because it would have gotten a lot worse. So mm -hmm. that, was our, that was our loss of the week. All right. Uh, so every trader kind of has their personal process for how they pick a stock and then what they do with that stock afterward, whether it be, uh, you know, how you scale out of a trade, et cetera. So tell me about how you or walk me through rather your process for making a trade. So what I like to do is actually know what the company do, does. And there's a reason for that, because a lot of people are like, hey, the chart will tell me everything I need to know. Um, no, first off, I manage money. I don't just trade charts. Um, but more importantly, I believe a stock's movement is based on the concept and the story, not just revenue and earnings. So some of my biggest winners are because I was like, oh, that's the type of story that will resonate and we can get an X type move. Oh, this is an apparel company that's cute. It's not going to get an X type move. So it's understanding what the company does what price to sales are, what price, what PE is, so I can establish how much this moves. I like to know a character of a stock. Over the years, I've got to know most stocks, right? I've traded something, almost every stock at one point. But really understand where they are uh, in terms of earnings, uh, you know, sales, and then take the chart, let it guide me, tell me best entry, and then finally establish more than anything else, risk reward. If the reward is not two, three, four, five times what I deem to be the risk, that's not an idea for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then figure out, as I told you previously, hey, is this one where I only think it's going 40, 50% max? 
but I really believe in this idea. And I don't think the downside is there. So how do I take 40 or 50% and maybe structure the trade? Trade structure took me 20 some odd years to figure this out. It's half the game sometimes. When to be mm -hmm. large, when to be small, maybe when to take an option, maybe when not to, because the IV is too high. So sometimes to take a trade like IWM, I mentioned this week, I said, ooh, if there's one, maybe we've got to focus on options because I'm so confident um, it, it's, it's IWM. It's probably only going to 194 in my opinion this summer, but every time there's a dip, there's, there's multiples of percentages to be made if you buy mm -hmm. it right. So um, I'm looking for a structure of the trade, uh, chart, fundamentals, and then finally how to enter. Because I, I never enter all at once, because I unless it's a really short-term trade, because I believe I'll never get the bottom when I'm buying. And when I'm selling, I know I'll never get the top. So I'd like to sell and have or thirds. All right. And so you mentioned this portfolio shift that you've had over the past few sessions and a focus in your trading room this week has been that market rotation that you mentioned out of large cap stocks into small cap, mostly, you know, your large cap tech and your smaller cap stocks. So talk me through how you identified that shift before it happened and how you have capitalized on it afterwards. Um, I identified it by, like I said, uh, and I don't know if this was our first chat or a second chat, but <laughs> what I believe is this, is I tend to not wait for a sign. I try to really establish a climate check. And what I mean by that is use Twitter, use CNBC, use the, the craziness of Kramer, use the RSIs, the charts, take a picture, take a snapshot of where we are. Right. Mm -hmm. And I do that every week. And last week I looked at it and I thought, we've gone nuts. I love NVIDIA, but when a billion dollar company, excuse me, when a trillion dollar company can go up 30% in a day, like, hello, that's, that doesn't happen. Now I loved earnings and I bought it. I'm sure we'll talk about it later. But the point is that these are signals to actually size down. And I thought, but I still think stocks can go higher. So where the hell do you go? Well, you go to mid and small cap that hasn't moved in forever because we've been so focused. So let's own IWM. What are the stocks that people like to own that move that have decent charts? And that's how we ended up in Mara based on Bitcoin or Plug Power, which is a cult favorite that I don't even love as a company. But I saw the chart yesterday in the mid to high eights and said, I have to be long. And that's how we stayed in Shopify, which I've been a big fan of since after earnings. And uh, it's just been a huge win for us. So that, that's how we've stayed in a lot of these names and, and focused on them. And then of course, IWM is just establishing if there's gonna be more upside, where does it come from? And where's there the most risk? I might wanna be short. So that told me, hey, this will be like, just, un this will be perfect. This never happens. I can be short, make real money, and really be aggressively long because we usually don't get such like firm rotation. This week it was mm -hmm. like one dropped off and one started working. So uh, last week I figured it had to happen. I didn't know the day or the week it would start. This week gave the signals and it happened. Great. All right. So traders often talk about their edge, the thing that makes them the trader they are, what they rely on, whether that be fundamentals or or charts, whatever it may be. What's your edge? What's your edge? So I answered this previously and I didn't include something. I'm so psyched we get to do it all over again. My right. first biggest edge is after 30 years knowing that um, being really intelligent or not so bright is not going to make the difference in how I trade. It, it, mm -hmm. if, in fact, if I try and get too intelligent, it could put me in the poorhouse and I can go out of business. So it's really just having the humility to know I'm not the best in the room and there'll always be someone better. Um, but then from there, my edge is really for me, right? And, and it's hard to teach. My edge is concepts. It's really it's been that way in art for me. It's been that way when I own nightclubs in 91, 92. It's really having a concept of what's exciting, where the puck's going to go, not do rampant investing and just guess, well, the puck should go here because I think so. Really have some bonafide, quantifiable information that tells me the puck should go here. 
start mm -hmm. edging into where I think the puck, puck is going, get some firm signals, the puck is actually on its way. And then once everyone wants to play in the same playing ground I'm in, not drinking the Kool-Aid and being willing to not get the top and being willing to start trimming and take some money off and then it probably money management. Not, not like I don't worry about home runs like a lot of people because I hit like doubles and triples over and over and all day, every day. Oh, I shouldn't, that sounds cocky. A lot. <laughs> and it just at the end of the year adds up to a lot more. And what I find is, so I have friends, right, who've taken some of my ideas and made millions of dollars and a couple of them, I'm sure I made millions of dollars, but they made many millions more. And I'd get pissed off, right? I'd be like, oh my God. Like, wow, that was all my idea. And then those certain people, though, sometimes are the people who lose millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So being that I'm 53 now, I, I don't have the temperament. My wife used to be like, you, you, I, I can't listen to you anymore. You know, I have my account going up and down entry day, hundreds of thousands and screaming and yelling. I don't do that anymore because I don't want to worry about stress like that because here's where I'm getting at. By the end of the year, I know if I manage money this way on a consistent basis, I will make a lot of money and do really well. So my edge is not trying to catch the top, not trying to catch the bottom, constantly thinking about money management and not overcharting things and really trying to use what I'm good at rather than just follow the crowd. I hope that wasn't too complicated. No, great. Uh, so just a reminder for everyone who's here with us live. I see you. I see the live number. We have a good amount of people here. I'm seeing the reactions, the likes, the light bulbs, all of that. Those are great. But we want to make sure that David is also answering your questions. So be sure in that live chat to the right side where the comments are, add your comment there, your question for David there. Him and I have a few more topics to talk about here between us. Uh, but then we'll be getting to those audience questions. There's a couple there already. But please submit them now so we can make sure we have time for them at the end. You don't want to be submitting them right at the end as we're kind of wrapping things up. We want to, you know, have time to get to all of them. So please do submit those right now. So uh, Dave, David, we've talked about how, you know, it, it's been a quieter week of economic data. We're not getting as many news driven days this week, next week. We'll talk a little bit later about it's going to be a big one. But some of the biggest news that we have gotten this week has been focused in the crypto space. We have the SEC suing both Binance and Coinbase. Coin shares plunged on Tuesday after that lawsuit was filed, but then up today after Kathy Wood's ARK Invest added to its stake in the company, the second largest holder of that stock. Does that signal anything for you about the stock? No, zero. Um, although I was a fan of Kathy early on, like I loved her way before ever she became so famous, a uh, mm -hmm. big fan of just how she did things. I didn't realize she was an awful money manager, but I <laughs> liked her foresight and how bright she was. So no, because she's not a money manager that I deem really to be someone to follow. It didn't signal bad or good. Um, but like I said to earlier, uh, what I really saw this week, which is a trade I didn't mention, is I saw tremendous strength in Bitcoin as mm -hmm. the SEC was going after uh, Coinbase and uh, whatever the firm is, I'm forgetting now, Binance. Binance. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm seeing Bitcoin back over 26,000. And I told the inner circle, or the group that we're involved with, and I looked and I said, guys, you it's as simple as this. I've told you for a couple of years now, when stocks go up on bad news, that's about as good as a buy signal as you'll get. And when stocks go down on good news, you don't get a stronger signal than that. So I said, time to be long Bitcoin, at least for the short term. I'm not going to drink the Kool-Aid. I'm not too excited about Bitcoin long term. I'm not too negative, but there's money to be made here and now. And we actually got long Mara. So no, Kathy didn't signal anything, but Bitcoin itself gave us a strong signal when it said, eh, I don't care what the SEC is doing or Gensler on CNBC, it, we're going high. Uh, so we did get long and I was pretty vocal about it when it was 26.1 and I think it went to 27,000. I like to play the short term edges on Bitcoin. I don't love it as an asset. So that, that was the signal. 
Yeah. Okay. With these uh, lawsuits that have been filed now against, again, Binance and Coinbase, the two largest crypto exchanges in the world, do you see any type of shift happening in the crypto space as a result of this action? Um, so, yes and no. Here's what I see. I see uh, if someone's interested in Bitcoin, it's something that's bullish because it was bound to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't not going to happen. It was a matter of when. So it's finally happening as it happens. Right. And people absorb it. You kind of take one of the biggest negatives away. OK, then everyone can talk about it's not a real asset or Kramer can say it's all a scam. But the real big negative is people cracking down. Right. The government cracking down. So if I'm a macro investor in Bitcoin, I love this happening because I'm like, let's get through it. It's almost like a kitchen sink corner. Let's let's just be done with this because it was on the horizon anyway. Um, so I actually look at it as it'll tell me if I'm right, right? I'm not a Bitcoin bull or a Bitcoin. But if I'm right, and I'm a big believer that this is a true currency, it is uh, the new anti-establishment. It is a way to protect yourself against devaluation of the dollar and blah, and blah, and blah. And I'm not making fun of people. I'm just not that guy. Well, mm -hmm. then it should hold up in the face of all this. Mm -hmm. So let's see. If it goes to 15,000, we go right back to lows. It tells you it probably isn't that real because it shouldn't just react that way. So if I'm a bull, it tells me um, a lot. If I'm a bear, it better react because everything I'm saying and I expect is coming true. So the asset better depreciate. So I think it's a great thing so people can really establish where we are in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency side. Great. All right. So I do want to talk a little bit about what's coming up next week. As I mentioned earlier, it is a big week, arguably going to be the biggest week of the month. We get both inflation data and the Fed decision uh, in that first half of the week. Tuesday morning, we'll get the May CPI report. Tuesday, later Tuesday morning, the Fed meeting begins. Then Wednesday morning, we get the May PPI, and then the Fed decision comes out at 2 p.m. Eastern. Two really big days kind of happening right next to each other for this, for traders. So how are you planning to approach next week? I think I'm just going to go to San Tropez and wish everyone luck and hope it works out. Um, so I really think a lot when it comes to earnings and big events like the Fed, I also think, where is the market? Like for me, mm -hmm. half of the game is where are we going into the event, right? Or expect, expectations built in or not. Um, I am not an economist and would probably be broke if I was, but uh, I am of the thought that although I thought there was going to be a pause, he probably is going to raise rates. That's not the conventional mm -hmm. wisdom on Wall Street, and he doesn't have to. But there, if, if his mandate is job growth and really slowing down the economy, well, go on your Facebook and look at everyone in Con and look at everyone in Saint-Tropez and look at everyone in Aspen and look at all the hotels and people aren't hurting, right? Well, look at <laughs> the main job jobs numbers <laughs> are not, not slowing down. Yeah. So to me, although we're at 60, 65% pause, seems he will. But all of that almost doesn't matter to me. Where it matters is where are we in the markets going into it? Mm -hmm. And if we are anywhere near 350 in the queues where big cap tech has been everything, I think there's more risk than reward. So um, if we correct, now let me walk you a little bit further. So my edge is always thinking a little bit ahead of time, not just charts. And mm -hmm. I told everyone earlier this week, even today, 354 or five before we came in much. Um, I had a wonderful lady I know forever named Cheryl on my chat. She's like, Q's, what do you think? And where are they going to go? You know, are you going to wait till you actually, this is what she asked. And it's a great question to bring up here. Cheryl mm -hmm. said, are you going to wait till there's concrete information next week to act? I said, no, it'll be too late. Like, what am I going to mm -hmm. do with it then? So my thought is if you're an institution and you're sitting on massive profits in NVIDIA, and we haven't seen moves like these in years, Meta, Earnings are out, right? So now it's the Fed. Are you just being mm -hmm. like, yeah, chill. Like, I'm up a ton, and I'm going to make more. No, you, you take some money off the table. So I told her, actually, we should pull back in big cap tech before Wednesday. 
So where I'm getting at is if we keep pulling back, my bullishness will go up a little bit. I'm going to gauge where the market is pre the event. If we come all the way in, by the way, the 21 days, all the way down there at like 340. Mm -hmm. Down there, I'll be a bit I do you think like, we're pausing this time, signal we'll pause now, right? Like that, uh, that you know, I'm not sure. So the thought is, when enough, there'll be side right in the market are, I'm a little bit less uh, aggressive risk off, um, but it'll, you know, market to that one point on the queue so it'll be where the queues are going into the event and i think he'll probably raise rates the market doesn't if he doesn't i won't be shocked and if he does i won't be shocked mm -hmm. there, I there's mean, reasons for both right san right. francisco on monday i mean you had mm -hmm. a huge huge operator of 2900 hotel rooms <laughs> give their properties back to the lender and we mm -hmm. have you know, a million banks still out there that are in jeopardy regional wise, I shouldn't say a million, but enough to scare people mm -hmm. that this is not over and raising rates is just going to hurt that situation. Mm -hmm. But they keep talking about jobs growth. So my answer is it really could go either way. All right. So now let's go to our audience question. Our first question, audience questions. Our first question is how do you know when to go against the crowd? Um, Really good question. I think it's a, a little bit of everything. Um, climate check is really important to how I do things. So mm -hmm. that means it could be as simple as hearing, you know, I, I when I start to hear people on Twitter that don't, okay, I'm really trying to think how to say this in a cohesive <laughs> manner. So I have a memory for nothing except stocks and how people trade. Like even on my chat, and it's not 50 or 100 people, it's a lot. Of people i kind of know everyone's personality and how they are same way on twitter even though i don't know people i know how they think by how they express themselves on twitter so when the novice people even this week i can't tell you how many people that i know by how they speak they could be geniuses so this is not like how i feel about them but i know they're not market savvy start asking lots of questions and get very loud and not in a bad way but they have tons of questions about what stocks to buy i use that and it usually more often than not works right when when things get overheated i use rsi so um being that i'm a bit older i know rsi and big cap tech at 80 i said this exact thing this week i said guys i don't care what they're saying about meta more often than not at 83 relative strength you're gonna make money short May not be easy, and it wasn't, and I had puts and I made money, but it had to go down and up and then down. But the bottom line is there is so much more risk than reward when you have any big cap. I don't mean like a hundred million. I mean all these multi-billion dollar companies. Well, there's no such thing as a hundred million, that's small cap. I don't mean a hundred billion, I mean all these companies that are near a trillion valuation are at 80 to 85 RSI. So match that up with a lot of FOMO on Twitter. Sometimes people on the chat that are cavalier that are like, oh, I made money on this and I'm, I'm buying the upside calls another 10 points higher. And what do you think of Tesla at 230? And I'll be like, you, you know, it's like 200 two days ago, right? <laughs> um, and they, they don't think about risk. That, that's to me a signal. Oh, I got to get more short. Um, next, I kind of look at things logically. So December, the world was ending. Everyone felt awful. And I said, okay, well, if we all hate the market, didn't you already sell? Mm -hmm. You're like, I hate the market. Eh, sell in two weeks. Hey, you, you sold. So who's left to sell? And what happens if anyone buys it? Um, and when the climate's that bad, do you usually make money being long? Especially if you're not buying some cockamamie internet stock or, you know, some company that has tons of debt with no cash flow. I'm buying the queues because they represent the best companies in America and no one cares about them anymore. And everyone says tech is not a buy. So didn't they sell every tech stock already? Okay, I'm going to buy some. Those are the moments. I'm not always going to be right where I do a climate check and really make kind of big decisions. I have no problem telling you because there's sometimes I'm early and I've, I've had a million losers in my career. But Meta was that way at 88. I didn't look at the balance sheet and say this number can't go i just said 
It is too cheap. This is horrific how it's trading. I have to own it. This is just dumb. I bought it for my son that day because I was like, this is just, this is that negative, right? Kramer's crying on national TV. I'm not making fun of him crying as much as like the stock had gone down 80% and he's crying saying, it's the worst company in the world. Don't own it. I was like, these are buy signals where I come from. So that's the answer to that question. All right. Our next question is, are you concerned about a blow off top in the market, especially with this move in the queues? Is AI creating a bubble or is it real? One, definitely real in my opinion. I, I don't even think it's remotely not real, right? Mm -hmm. When you have a company like NVIDIA that reports 50% upside on a quarter, on a quarter. So they, they don't do like 200 million in revenue, they do billions. So when you have a company literally upside guidance of 4 billion and they're talking about AI, that, that's really real. <laughs> um, and what it's gonna do, the world's real. Now, um, a bubble. I've gone through the cannabis bubble, gone through the internet bubble. I went even through the, what was that business that lasted like two seconds? Uh, 3D printing bubble. I've seen more bubbles than you can imagine. <laughs> um, th this hasn't even started. This isn't a bubble yet remotely. Bubbles are when you start to see deal. It's when I'm looking at deals and literally half the deals I'm seeing are gonna be an AI. It's when you're starting to see companies that just were formed with like literally, I don't know, a hundred million dollar valuation and some guy just left Google and he's got an AI company but he doesn't even have software yet. Or you see a SPAC form. We're not seeing that a lot. So that doesn't mean NVIDIA can't come in, but it means in terms of bubbles, first, second inning, this isn't even close to a bubble. We're not, we're not seeing companies change their names yet to the X AI. Mm -hmm. So again, don't confuse, that doesn't mean the market can't pull back. It just means that in terms of bubbles go, this is nothing yet. Okay. The next question is, do you have a bias toward going long or short in the market or does it not matter to you? Such a good question and how it relates to me. I used to be a really good short, like really good. Not as good anymore. I do it a lot. I make money and some people would say you're good, but I, I have less of that eye of the tiger. Hmm. So my answer is probably they're pretty even now. Years ago it was short. It's because I didn't mind like shorting the thousand, up another five, another thousand, thousand. But there was a lot of stress involved in the fight mm -hmm. and the and what so many people just went through in, in video. Like I was very forthright with friends, with people on my chat, with people on Twitter. I'm like, stop. Trust me. Because it's not about what you're going to, and this is going to be long-winded, but it's why it's definitely more even or less short. If you keep shorting in video every, excuse my language, goddamn day, do you know how much money you're going to miss an opportunity cost? It's not about what you make or lose on NVIDIA. It's that you're like, like this all day. And there's like four different ideas that just cross your desk that you make tons of money for. So unless the trend is truly broken, I'm kind of even to more long because I don't need the stress because then I'm going to miss the next four home runs. And mm -hmm. even to more long in okay. terms of what I do. Next question is, is this Q's pullback something you are looking to scale into? Granted, the rotation into IWM, maybe it's better to stay away from tech for the time being. The answer is positively yes. Into the 21 day, it's another 10 points lower. And I will even buy probably two or three big cap tech stocks on the way down, i.e. like an NVIDIA type. Um, I won't go massively long and be as aggressive. And I mm -hmm. did uh, compliance reasons, whatever. I actually started buying NVIDIA today. It looked awful, broke. A low that it held from last week, broke that low, pointed out if it breaks it, it's probably going to go lower. It's got room all the way to 366 and then it's 21 days, like a mile away from that. But mm -hmm. I'll buy 10% of a position just so I don't lose focus in. Um, so to me, that's the same thing as buying cues. So yes, if we pull back enough, I will focus on the cues. But we used to have 20 and 30 point pullbacks in the cues. We haven't had one in forever, so I think people forgot it can happen. I think we're on our way to having one and getting closer to the 21 day down uh, 340, 338. I'm not looking at a chart, but somewhere around. 
Okay. Uh, I do know we still have a large audience here with us live. Uh, so everyone, please do submit your questions uh, for David. We probably have about 20 ish minutes left here in the event. So submit those now so we can get them answered. Uh, David, while we wait for those to come in, I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, your focus on options in, in the inner circle. I know uh, you and Kira and Rick, who are all moderators there in the inner circle, buy a lot of puts and you buy a lot of calls and you, you use options strategically in your trading. Uh, do you prefer trading options over equities? What do you see options being better for versus just straight buying a stock? Talk, talk me through it. Sure. Um, so there's uh, a few ways of looking at options and the conventional wisdom of why you always hear 90% of the people lose money in options is because they're like cowboys and cowgirls and how they use them. I always think of options as a way to maintain discipline, no max risk, right? What, you, what you're going to lose, you can, you'll know the minute you buy that option, uh, as long as you're not selling naked puts or calls, which I don't suggest most people do. Um, and also it's a way to breed patience. Because if you really believe in something, you also, again, if you know your max loss, sometimes instead of just saying, oh, I'm up 10 grand or 20 grand, whatever that amount is, you're like, it's not at my target. This is what my risk is. I'm going to hang in there. So I utilize that. I also find it a way for very short term trades um, in big cap tech, where I tend to thrive better than most, to capture large, large gains, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so a great example this morning was Netflix, um, had some coverage this morning. I actually said this quote, I said, Netflix is up like $13 this morning. Not excited to buy it. Not even that excited about the stock, but given the coverage and the two firms and the chart, it might be a gap and go day. It might trend to be up 20, 25 points. Mm -hmm. So no shot in hell, I'll buy the stock. I know that sounds funny, but I will buy Friday's options with spec money because I see potential to make a lot of money without taking a lot of risk. So mm -hmm. I'm going to, at the open, focus on Netflix and look for the right option. Someone on the chat can write, I think I focused on the 415s. Um, I really have a long day, but I think it was 415s <laughs> for Friday. And sure enough, Netflix gapped open, pulled back a bit. I bought those options around four. And within like, I don't know, 30 seconds, there were five, a couple of minutes, there were six, literally in 10 minutes, there were eight. So the way I look at it is, do I really want to go out and buy a thousand shares of Netflix up 13 or 14 off of lows? What was Netflix, like 200 or something? It's just not an exciting story here. It's done well, earnings are okay, they're coming along. But the point is, it's a little late in the game, but there was a way to capitalize it, capitalize on it and know what your risk is. So mm -hmm. that's how we use options. Same thing when I'm baiting, maybe a conventional move, something that's up 82, 83 RSI, that I know, you know what? Do I really want to be short 2000 meta? It doesn't go down every day. But if I buy puts for next week and I know what my risk is, even though it's not conventional wisdom to be short meta here, it's, it's probably going to pay me something we did this week. So that's how I utilize options is to maybe measure some calm, not get too excited, not get too nervous, allow me to stay in trades longer. And then finally, just know my max risk and reward. It's, it's definitely something I use to manage money in a more conservative fashion versus being a cowboy. And then finally, when I want to be really aggressive, it's a way to be aggressive and trade around the position. Plug power. We bought some yesterday and I said, you know, I really, I don't like plug. <laughs> I really don't, but I really like this trade. So how do we make the most of it? Oh, let's buy some calls. So we bought $10 calls at like 60 cents that went to a dollar and change today. I get it. There are tons of people that make hundreds of percent every day, but to me, you can make like 70, 80% an option in a day. That's a home run. Um, so what a great way to buy stock, but also add some risk without getting crazy. There were 60 cents. You don't have to buy, you know, millions of dollars worth. So that's how we use them is how to put a turbo engine on something without taking um, too much risk and be responsible. Mm -hmm. Great. Our next question is a really great one. I think he, Robert asked, what hurts more losing money or missing trades? Oh my God. This is it. Hey, Robert, <laughs> I don't know. If you're on my chat. I love you. This, this <laughs> is like something we talk about all the time. Mm -hmm. So 
for me, it is 1,000% missing something. Always. It is never the loss. I think that comes in from my, I have confidence. Like I, I've done this a lot of years, like million bear markets, bull markets, like kind of mm -hmm. okay. I know I'm going to figure it out and make money. But where I'm still at in nearly 30 years is not listening to myself. And maybe even, especially with the chat now where people rely on me, sometimes being more conservative than I used to be when I didn't have so many people relying on me. And what I find is when I don't follow through on something that I put work into and real thought and time and don't allow it to happen and then see profits happen without me, it's not the money. It's I, I want to respect myself and believe buck up like you put in the work like have the strength and the discipline to let it follow through and then when i don't and i watch it happen oh that that'll bother me way more than losing 10 20 grand on the trip any day of the week okay great uh our, i know i lost it uh, we had a question and i refreshed my page and now it is gone so i'll try to get it back um for you when you're going into a trade, do you have like a kind of a set stop rule that you follow for every trade? Do you have kind of a set no. strategy you follow or Great do you answer. approach Great each, question. each trade individually? Yeah. So I really believe, and I don't know why more people don't talk about this. The climate dictates what you should be willing to risk. Mm -hmm. So we are now in a climate that's much more heated. Things have gone really far. I don't think there's that much upside, which probably means I should limit my downside, right? So what I like to say, and I said this on, when I was on this uh, wolf thing this weekend, and I said, guys, like I'm really about to get much more aggressive on mid and small cap bio, and I, I'm going to be more short big cap tech. Um, and I just, that, that's how I see things. So if I'm doing that, I'm more a trader now. I'm not an investor. Right now, mm -hmm. it's if I'm wrong, I want to get out. If I'm wrong on Lulu, like just get out and take your loss because we are not at the point where everything's dirt cheap and there's tons of upside. So mm -hmm. it's time to be a trader and really kind of envision things and wh where they can go on the downside, not just the upside. Now let's go back to COVID. Okay, I'm going to put half of my net worth in Amazon, the other part in Shopify and the other part in a stock that I think is going to be in the next Tesla that everyone thought I was crazy about. But the, the Amazon was simple. I'm like, okay, so who's more important than Amazon? No one, zero, not even Apple. So that, that's easy. And if I die, who cares if I lose all my money? Because my kid's gonna die too, because we're all gonna die of COVID. So what's the upside and what's the risk? The risk is we die. And I, like, I'm not even trying to be funny. Like it was the easiest trade in the world because if we're all gonna die, then it doesn't matter if I lose money. And if we don't die and we survive and get through all this, which was more than likely, or else I wouldn't be focused on investing and be hanging out with my family. If we are going to survive through all this, then who's going to benefit today? Like who benefits the most? That's Amazon, right? So um, it, it's just, anyway, that's how I go about things. Did I get too long with it? I feel like something. No, no, no. Yeah, you're good. All right, oh, everyone, like, so. What I'm, oh, here, let me. No, 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 keep going. Keep no, going. No, I, but I, I got the thing where I lost myself. <laughs> Bottom line, I really didn't deem there to be a lot of risk. And I thought the upside was four, five, ten times what I was investing. So at times like that, God, I really got lost there. It's uh, times like that where the climate dictates how much I'm willing to lose. So I was willing to lose a lot more. I, I had days I was down six figures and was perfectly happy because I really thought there was so much upside if this worked. I don't feel that way today. So the climate and where we are in the markets dictates that for me. Sorry, I got lost. I guess I'm old. No, no, no you're good. Uh, so for everyone that's with us live, this is kind of my last call for questions. So please do submit those now. I, our live number of audience is still very high. So I have not gotten many questions for how high the number is. So please do submit those questions, but I'll keep asking David questions for you. So for traders who may be new, uh, not experienced, or maybe they came into uh, the market during COVID, the kind of gold, Goldilocks market, everything worked at the time. Now everything doesn't work every single day, all the time. What's your advice for traders who maybe have never experienced a market environment like we're seeing in 2023? 
I think that, I don't know why it's not said more. There's so many just dumb mistakes that, first off, you're kind of going to have to make on your own. But if you can find someone, it's not about paying them, right? I don't care if it's a chat or if it's a buddy. Finding a mentor that you can really rely on because mm -hmm. stock picking is really not what it's about. It's about position sizing, how to exit things, how to take a loss. And that's what people's, and then how it affects their brain. Like you take a loss and how they screw up on the next trade because they want to make it back the same day. And finding someone you can truly that has nothing to gain in helping you and just wants to generally helping you. Like that's, that's worth its weight in gold. That literally could save you two, three years of your life of stress. So finding a mentor somehow, some way, it, like people don't realize, like it, cause you're not gonna get it from a book. Experience beats mm -hmm. everything. And then the other part is really dealing with the emotions of trading. So I always say, just please read Mark Douglas, read Trading in the Zone, cause emo emotions affect 95% of us. Mm -hmm. um, th those are two things. And then, Use Twitter. Twitter is the most underused product for investing, not to follow like some crazy bucket shop type people. You know, there are a lot of lunatics with tattoos and tester uh, Lambos and stuff on there screaming about stocks. It's not about that. There's some like really bright people. People I, I, I would only hope to have that bring that share information. Um, and there are people like me who actually follow them who can tell you to follow that give you information. Like there was a guy out there. Think about it that told everyone and walked them through that Silicon Valley Bank was no longer, before it was no longer. Mm -hmm. That was free information that literally probably produced hundreds of millions, if not, well, hundreds of millions in profits. That exists out there. So get to know Twitter and utilize it. That's a, that's a free like utensil, right? That, that's huge. Now, there are a lot of, you've got to go to ignore 90% of the lunatics. But the 10%, there's some special people out there. So get to know how to utilize Twitter. It's a free you know, platform that you should use. The next audience question we got is how do you decide on what to focus on day to day? For example, individual stocks versus indices, et cetera. Risk reward in the shortest period of time. What gives me the most reward with the least amount of risk today versus what do I think is going to happen and transpire over the next few days? So example, because might as well use today, right? Mm -hmm. What was the first thing I did today? Well, I told people that I thought cues would continue to come in, although they were higher and looked like they weren't going to, and to continue to hold IWM and trim on the way higher. But the first new trade was, I think, Netflix, because I looked at what was going to happen. I said, okay, if this is going to happen, I'm going to be right usually it's going to be right away. It's not going to go down and then up. It's going to give me a quick little pullback. And if I'm right, it's going to run. So Netflix, I thought if it's a trending day and I buy 415 calls and this stock goes to, I don't know, even 420 today, it'll be up two, three hundred percent. I better focus on Netflix because IWM I'm in, it's going to go higher because plug I'm in, it's going to go higher. I'll put some sales out on the way. But this is what demands my attention most. And usually there's a two and a three and I go through that list. But try and figure out, you know, where is my attention needed right now versus what can I look at in 10 minutes? Next question is, do you have longer term option and common swing picks four weeks plus? He said, I have a full-time job, which is hard to trade into a day. Yes, yes to both all the time since the beginning of time. The stocks I own for a year or two years. Uh, and on options, some of my biggest trades are where I look at a theme, like biotech sometimes or the queues, and uh, we'll look for you know mo large moves over a period of months. My business is not based on day trading. It's based, I, I'd say we're 70, 80% swing. When things get very volatile and I feel it's time to put on less risk, but absolutely my my forte is more swift. It's telling people what I think about IWM, buying it, holding it, and trying to hang in there for the real money as it goes high. So uh, yes, we do it, and we do it very often. On so my long-term options and stocks. So my kind of closing question here is, as I mentioned at the beginning for the audience, David is the leader of the Inner Circle Virtual Trading Floor at T3 Live. Uh, so David, just tell me for yourself. One second, sorry. <laughs> I Hold have on. one right behind me too. She's 
walking around. Um, so just tell me for, and for the audience, how has opening that community and leading that community changed your personal trading? Uh, a little bit too conservative at times out of fairness. Um, I really, I don't like a lot of what goes on on the internet and Twitter and, uh, you know, just the, the risk taking and people that get hurt. Right. Um, and, uh, I, I tend to worry not because I'm mother Teresa, it's just how I'm built. So I'm not like the nicest guy, but I do worry about others probably more than myself. Um, in fact, my hedge fund did the best when I kicked out most investors and didn't have to worry about whether I perform for them. I, I just have I don't know, Jewish conscience or something, whatever you want to call it. Um, so sometimes I get a little conservative, but it also enables me uh, on the good side to um, think through things. In other words, have a process and plan a little bit better because I have to plan for everyone else, which means sometimes I have to plan for me. So it means uh, rather than getting caught up in selling some IWM this morning or trimming some plug, I was like, well, no, no, no. we don't want to miss Netflix because that's kind of going to be my star trade, I think, off the open. So let me focus it. So I made more money because of it and they make more money. So there's give and take. I do get a little conservative and maybe uh, take things off too soon or take a little less risk. For myself, I, I embrace risk. I, I tend to love volatility. So sometimes I'm a little overly conservative, but more than anything, great focus and planning. That's, that's the good stuff. 